This is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday Edition. Four perspectives on caring for your employees from the archives. Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFurio. I'm your host for the show. Welcome, and uh, I hope that you're having an amazing week. This is the first time in Founder Friday history uh, that we are going to be looking back into the archives and pulling out some clips from past episodes to talk about caring for your employees and your staff and, and really setting up a great employee culture. And I'm excited to share these with you. We're going to be hearing from four founders from past episodes, and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to Keys to the Shop, I would encourage you to do so. Wherever you get your podcasts, if you would just hit the subscribe button, you will never miss an episode. And if you have the opportunity to share this show with a friend or many friends, <laughs> that would be really fantastic as well. Now, today's episode of Keys to the Shop is brought to you by Prima Coffee. You know, Prima is a leading specialty coffee equipment supplier who supplies the greatest equipment from all over the world. They curate this equipment to fit perfectly with the needs of both their enthusiasts and their professional customers. So you're, if you're just looking to build out a home bar or a really awesome commercial coffee bar, they have the equipment and the expertise that you need to get the right gear for the job. Helping you succeed in making great coffee at home or in the shop is really what drives them. And I've known them for a long time. I definitely vouch for them. You know, just go to prima-coffee.com and see what I mean. They have a really fantastic selection, a lot of great resources to help you learn about the equipment. So go visit Prima Coffee at prima-coffee.com. Thank you so much, Prima, for your support of Keys to the Shop. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Pacific Barista Series. This, of course, is a line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed for and right alongside of professional baristas and the standards for excellence that they have. Whether you're talking about almond milk, soy, coconut, rice, or oat milk, their ability to take the heat from steaming, produce an unmatched, silky texture, and to keep the flavor balance of your beverage focused on coffee makes this a perfect choice for your cafe's menu. You need to get this in your store and try it out for yourself. So go to pacificfoods.com and learn more about the Barista Series. Again, get it in your store, try it out, uh, and see how the Barista Series line of plant-based performance beverages can really help elevate the non-dairy offerings in your shop. Thank you so much, Pacific, for your support of Keys to the Shop. Okay, so today we get to look back into the archives of Founder Friday, and I've pulled out some clips of conversations that I've had with four founders from past episodes that have to do with taking care of your staff. Now, we're going to be starting today with a more recent Founder Friday guest. That is the co-founder of Andytown Coffee Roasters, Lauren Crabb. Lauren was our guest on Founder Friday back in May, episode 156. In my conversation with Lauren, we got to really see a candid look inside the world of Andytown Coffee Roasters, their humble beginnings, and the uh, vision that they have had from the beginning to really serve their community and their staff well. From their original 600-square-foot shop to now over 50 employees in five locations in a roastery later, the care and service to their community and to their staff has been a constant value from day one to both Lauren and her husband, Michael, who run Andy Town. And I wanted to pull out some of this conversation today to give Lauren's take on caring for staff. So let's listen in to Lauren Crabb from episode 156 of Keys to the Shop. How do you manage all of it? What what are the logistical uh, tricks or habits that you've taken on that help you stay on top of what's going on at Andy Town? Well, I have an amazing management team and that's really like the short answer of it. <laughs> and when, when we expanded, like the only, the only reason why we expanded is I got pregnant our second year of business at, at Andy town. And cause I was doing everything for, for the company. And I, had to, I was forced to step away because the only thing that made me sick was the smell of coffee. Oh no. And so I, for the first time I had to hire three people to replace me because I was working so much and I was absolutely terrified that 
because I had to hire these people to replace me that I wasn't going to be able to support myself on top of having other people like work in the business. So I was forced to really put on my like business owner hat and be like, how do I grow this company enough to sustain a manager as well as, you know, myself as a business owner? Um, not to say that I don't manage cause I do. Um, but that was like where I really was forced to think about it from a business owner perspective, as opposed to a barista slash roaster slash baker perspective. And that's when, you know, we, we hired a cafe manager for the first time, uh, which was terrifying to me because I didn't want to step away, but I had to because I was pregnant and I physically couldn't do it anymore. Um, but it's like, I, I think if I, ne- if I never physically had to step away, I don't think Andy town would have grown at all because I would still be working bar every day and I'd still be there, um, with, you know, just focused on the day to day. Um, so I thank my son for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so like when I, when I was forced to sit at home and really think about the business that's when I started thinking about growth opportunities and that's when we you know we really started thinking about Andy Town as more than just a neighborhood cafe um and more like a roasting company um and that's yeah that's kind of how we approach the growth there and that's yeah the 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 hiring people was to manage things was the hardest thing I, I had to do it sounds like it's worked out very well. Um, <laughs> Not without hiccups, for sure. <laughs> well, no, because it's... you have to manage the managers, right? And yeah, managing managers is so much harder than managing people, like managing baristas. How so? It's, it's just like, it's really hard to manage managers without micromanaging the managers, if that makes sense. Especially if you're, if you're hiring someone like if like for me it was like i'm managing the cafe and now i'm passing the torch and it was like so impossible for me to be hands off you know it's like i'm still i still want to be a part of every tiny decision which you can still do when you have one shop you can't do that when you have three shops and you can't do that when you have five shops it's like you have to tr- really trust your managers to make those decisions and when they when they do something that, that I wouldn't necessarily do, I realize that it's because I never gave them any structural support or like training. You know, I'm just, I'm hiring people to be like, here, order milk here, hire people. And then when, when they were making calls that I disagreed with, I was looking at it and I was like, like thinking about it. I'm like, why did they make that call differently than the way I would do it? And I'm like, oh, because I never trained them on how to actually make these difficult decisions. Uh, I was just making them for them. Like they would come to me with the difficult decision and I would make that decision. And as I got further away from the shops, like they were having to make those difficult decisions. And I wasn't giving them the proper support. And, And that's something that coming from a background where like my first management job was owning Andytown. It's like I had never worked as a manager and seen what managerial support looks like. You know, that's that's something that I had to learn the hard way uh, as as I was running my business. And now now I think I have a better handle on it. You know, I read a bunch of books about it. I, you know, listened to a bunch of podcasts um, and I feel like I have a little bit more of a handle on it. But there were so many mistakes that Andy Town made. Um, when we were in that growth phase that were just because Michael and I didn't, we it's, I don't want to say that we weren't qualified to run a company that size because we are, but we just weren't as prepared as we should have been. Um, and yeah, that was a very difficult growing pain for us. Yeah. I, it sounds like a lot of the difficulties around people and just, taking on a larger staff that is responsible for this shop, but yeah, their expectations of you um, are going to impact 
how you manage, how you lead, and was was that a factor in some of the mistakes that were made? Were they largely like human resources type mistakes? Basically, like because we didn't we didn't even have <laughs> I we didn't even have like an employee handbook, right? Because we were like just like you know Michael and I were were doing all the training. Our employee handbook was like the bare minimum that you need in the state of California. It didn't have like you know, we didn't even have our company values written down. We, it was just kind of like, this is who we are. And, you know, you're going to, you're going to know who we are because you're working alongside us. And that works when it's just one shop, but that doesn't work when it's three shops. Um, and we were really challenged to sit down and be very like reflective and, and understand like, you know, like you, we need to make it clear of like what, Andy town stands for so that when our employees have to make difficult decisions, they can look to those, to those values and, and make the decisions according to the Andy town way. Um, and that, you know, it's like when you're, when you're just one shop and you're just running it by yourself, it's, you don't, you don't necessarily have to, to do that. It's good if you do that, but it's not necessary, but when you're running a company with, you know, 40, 50 employees, like you, you need to get your act together, you know? And that's something that Andy town now, now I feel like we really have much more of a handle on it. And that's thanks, thanks to um, Brenda, who is um, our current operations manager. Um, She, she built those systems. Like she wrote our handbook. She helped us and she started with us as a cashier and she, you know, we got her HR trained and we, she was managing our shops and, you know, that sort of internal support um, and creating that structure was, was what Andy Town needed. And she um, knew a lot about what needed to be systematized because yeah. she was receiving like all of the feedback from every exactly. you know, lack of systems and all that. Yeah, exactly. So she received that feedback and she, like built the systems that that Andy Town needed. She's actually leaving in a couple of weeks. I'm very sad, but I'm very happy for her. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's like it's it's you know, and and Michael and I really relied on on our teams to to sort of build Andy Town, and, and we, we still we have an amazing group of managers, and we we have this whole time had really great managers, and like when when Andy Town as a company, like when we have when we have issues, it's never, I never blame like the people, you know, it's, it's not about the, the people that are in place. It's, it's like, where, where did we go wrong to not give people the tools to do their jobs? Right. Like, did we not set the right expectations? Did we not give them the right tools for success? Did we not give them the right training? Because, you know, the reality is it's like, we have spectacular staff and we, we have from the very beginning, and when we're running into issues, it's, it's never about the people. It's, it's about, you know, it's about where did we go wrong, um, as, as owners and as a company, like, and how can we work to improve ourselves so that, so that we, it doesn't happen again. And it's that constant sort of like self reflection and, and improvement mindset that we try to instill in, in, in everyone. Well, of course, I would encourage you to go and listen to the full episode over at keystotheshop.com. On the episodes page, you can just click on uh, Founders, and it'll pull up all the episodes. It's episode 156. The conversation was just so honest and so rich uh, and so inspiring. Um, I would encourage you to go out and listen to this. And go find out more information about Andytown Coffee Roasters by visiting their website, andytownsf.com. Okay, well, next up, we're going to go back in time a little bit further, and we're going to go to episode 108, and that is going to be with the founder of BU Cafe and BU Blue in Durham, North Carolina, Dorian Bolden. In my conversation with Dorian, we talked about how his love of coffee brought him from a world of finance to uh, coffee shop ownership, and and the journey that he's taken as an owner to learn how to care for the business, to care for himself. And, uh, and to care for his staff. And it's a really dynamic conversation that especially touches on the need to be able to um, take care of yourself and then in turn be able to take care of your staff and create an environment 
that is uh, enjoyable to be in for both you and the people that work for you. So let's listen into this clip of Dorian Bolden from episode 108 of Keys to the Shop. In, in terms of leadership, what do you uh, expect from yourself as far as setting an example uh, for others to follow and to inspire them to to do good work. So when I think about that in terms of you know how do you lead by example, you know one of my earlier mentors, um, and again that's probably something I recommend to any of your listeners, anybody starting a business is don't be afraid to ask somebody, find somebody who's done this before, and just try to meet with them quarterly. I mean if you can monthly, great, but I was fortunate to have some amazing mentors uh, over the years. So, you know, one in particular at the very beginning, um, she and her brother owned several restaurants and she would tell me, you know, you need to know your non-negotiables. You know, what are the things you just, you will not negotiate on. And, you know, it's funny, I, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about this, I said, well, what are, what are my non-negotiables? I mean, it's, you know, is there thou shall not steal? I mean, you know, it's kind of like, you know, your non-negotiables <laughs> seem kind of simple. But what she was meant was, though, were what are your core values? And now, you know, almost 10 years later, you know, we have um, our mission statement in terms of what's our purpose as, you know, the ultimate community gathering place. And that is our mission statement. And we make sure, you know, everybody knows that. And when new new people, uh, when uh, you know, our new hires and new team members are coming in, you know, I'll stop them and say, hey, look, what's the mission statement? Do you know it? And if not, okay, I need to make sure you understand why. And because of that is, you know, they, they need to understand that, you know, here it is. We have, you know, someone like maybe Miss Shirley who, you know, is homeless. But, you know, when she comes in, we treat her with the level of dignity and respect that we treat the venture capitalists that are sitting, you know, three tables down on a business deal. Um, you know, people who come in and they have money to spend, you know, unless they're causing a disturbance or, you know, unless for some, you know, rare circumstance, <clears throat> you know, we, this is their third, this is their place to be you. And I think that has really served us well because everybody comes in with that understanding of the ultimate community gathering place. And you're right, I, you know, I lived, I think that's one thing that I've just lived, um, and practiced just more, just more easily because that's just, that is the essence of being cafe. But then the core values, I think we've developed and evolved over time with the, just the nature of great people that have come through our doors and, really helps solidify, you know, what we really are about as an organization, as a culture. And for that is, you know, we make sure we do, we go beyond customer service. And, and not, of course, in retail, that can, that can be hard to do sometimes, but still, that, that's what we're about. Um, you know, we are about, you know, teamwork always. You know, we realize that some places, you know, some people just work better by themselves and the loners. We're just, we're really team oriented and we expect that. So people who, don't pitch in and don't help out. They don't necessarily really last long. Um, you know, financial accountability means growth. You know, we are really, uh, you know, that's from just my finance days. I love smart people and I love people smarter than me. I mean, I want smart people. I want to teach people, make sure that they know we're going to hold them financially accountable. You know, the reason we're able to take on this opportunity, um, you know, at Duke is because of, you know, our ability to and grow is because we've been able to hold each other accountable financially, especially over the past two years, bringing in um, just, just you know, smarter and greater leadership as well as we've grown. No shortcuts, you know, really having pride in what we do. And then it's funny, the one that everybody loves the most is, you know, no ego, just be you. Mm. And, um, you know, we even have a little tagline. We say, you know, unless you're an asshole, then be you someplace else. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, that really is the essence of, you know, no ego because, you know, it's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about, it really is about the greater good, the greater community. And it's so easy to lose sight of that, especially in today's, you know, in today's society. And so I think a lot of times it's reminding the people that come in that, look, I, I get it. Uh, things happen, especially things outside of work. But let's try to make sure we support each other. Remember, it's not about us. Uh, let's make sure we're trying to do the job at hand, that we're trying to do something better for the community, for each other. And let's have fun while we work. And I think over the years, we've been able to just really develop a great culture of people, of an organization, which in the past two years has really skyrocketed. I think as I become a lot more um, 
purposeful in finding people around those core values now that we've really solidified them um, like two years ago. And so now we, we preach to our core values. We preach to our mission statement. We preach to our culture. And, you know, you know, you hear a lot of these organizations and these companies and these books say, you know, what is it? Uh, culture uh, beats um, strategy for breakfast. Uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast or beat strategy for breakfast. Yeah. But it really is so much about that when you, that's the one thing I wish I had known when I first started, the importance of finding the right people and building the right culture because the right culture will be there and it will help you define what you want to do to figure things out. And so, yeah, I think that probably the biggest reason for our longevity and our growth. So I imagine with all that you have going on, of course, you know, talking about those values and talking about your, your mission is, you know, like you said, it's, it's your main mode of keeping things together and being, having the right people there. It's gotta be the same kind of thing that re- when you were in that position of just, you know, getting buried in operations and not able to see the financials. And for a lot of people that are um, delegated to take care of booking or to take care of um, the wait staff or, or whatever it may be that there is on their plates, it must be hard to always have that in mind. And so that just really is great that it's a constant stream of reminding because I imagine it's, it's especially with the four models all at once, easy to just get buried and feel like what are, what am i even doing and forget about the mission statement yeah um you know so it's funny right if, if all this we're actually in the process of printing it out for all these years because uh, as much <laughs> as we practice and we preach it's like wow we're actually printing it out and it's like putting on the door everybody sees it on the way out and it is i think that's the nature of business and i think that's also still what you know separates uh, businesses that sometimes grow faster from those who, who don't in terms of being able to try to find that balance. And, you know, looking back on it now, you know, I realized being able to make time, and that's the thing that sometimes business owners, uh, and myself included when I first started, you feel like you just, there's never enough time. And I think there's one thing that I've, at least for me, that I've kind of, um, made it a goal that anytime I feel like I don't have enough time for something, then I do what I can to try to make myself to, uh, or to, to create more time to make a right decision so that I'm not, I don't feel hurried. And of course there are times you got to make a quick decision. And sure. of course you, you do that. But, you know, again, that's, I think that's why I close on Sundays to make sure I don't lose sight of, you know, my family time or, you know, I, you know, started working out, about when I was going through the, the development project to, to move into our new home, I um, remember that at that point, like soon after, I really went hard, uh, started, you know, working out uh, with a trainer <clears throat> and, you know, I lost I think, like, close to about 60 pounds. Wow. Um, and yeah, and it, part of that was just really making sure I made time for, for my wellness and well-being, just my mental state and just for health. And so I think the ability to start creating, you know, forcing yourself to make up, to have balance allows you to make smarter decisions. And I think that's the one thing is so often we feel hurried and, um, we're, you know, if you feel tired and, uh, continuously, you feel like there's just never enough time. And a lot of times that can lead to stress and at least the bad decisions. That, and, you know, and of course your staff can pick up on that. Mm-hmm. And so I think being able, uh, being able to take care of your self is so important i can tell you right now that is by far one of the greatest competitive advantages you will ever have over someone else is that if you know how to take care of yourself take care of your mental state so that when you come in you're coming in with a smile like that alone is saying hey how was your day you know how did it go last night or when someone jesus today i I, like i had to work a shift today it's filling in and Ooh, uh, one, of, one of our staff members, great guy, he's been with us uh, for over three years. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, he, he gets a little flustered. And uh, today, get a little flustered and just go the whole thing of ranch on both of us, oh, um, no. all over my leg. <laughs> it was like in the dish pit. And it's just like, okay, whew, okay, I am covered in ranch. <laughs> in the trash, and the trash can is literally, you know, 10 centimeters away. It's right there, but okay. 
So, and, you know, and I, you, you end up laughing about it. And, you know, and that's the thing about, I just noticed, is I think being able to take care of myself and put things in perspective and have that balance, that allows me to have fun with my staff, allows me to have fun with my leadership team. And so, yeah, if you're, if you're not having fun in your business, man, I'm telling you, work on that because that I, I lost that at one point, Chris. I mean, that was the one thing I, and I remember getting to a point where it wasn't fun anymore and mm-hmm. we didn't have the right culture. We I was stressed all the time, but, you know, being able to work on myself and, you know, and started remembering why I'm in this in the very beginning, what we talked about, kind of the rosy picture, you know, yeah, it, it really has propelled our business in the past couple of years. It was really enjoyable to talk with Dorian and to see the success of their company. And uh, after this conversation, he launched BU Blue, which has been a success. Go listen to the full episode over at keystotheshop.com. That's episode 108, Dorian Bolden of BU Cafe and BU Blue. And go visit his website as well over at bucafe.com. That's B-U as in B-E-Y-U, cafe with two Fs, dot com. All right, so next up is one of my first Founder Friday guests all the way back from March in 2017. Um, That was episode 17, actually. And we're talking with none other than Jonathan Rubenstein of Joe Coffee Company in New York. It was such a wild ride to uh, talk with Jonathan, how they went from a small cafe to now scaling to over uh, 19 stores across New York and Philadelphia and um, taking on roasting, taking on investment from Union Square Hospitality Group. That's Danny Meyer's company. And one of the great things about Joe Coffee Company is that their values match so well with the values that you would read in Danny Meyer's book, uh, Setting the Table. So focused on hospitality, not just to the customer, but especially to the staff. And caring for them has been a primary concern all the way through the scaling process. And, and I've pulled out a clip from our conversation that really speaks to that. Uh, because as you grow, one of the things that happens in shops all the time is we tend to forget about the people and get focused on the expansion and all of the details that go with it. And Jonathan just has fantastic insight into this and has walked the walk for many, many years. So uh, you're definitely going to learn something from his episode. So let's listen into this episode with Jonathan Rubenstein uh, from episode 17 of Keys to the Shop. It seems like maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this, did being a talent agent to help you acquire uh, a, a propensity for being more open to hearing what other people want and then also recognizing talent in others that resonate with your vision? I think so. I mean, the, the kind of talent agent I was, was, it was very different than the kind of you know, quote unquote talent. This was actors and they come with their own set of deep <laughs> personalities and issues. Um, but I think, yes. I mean, I think I took from that, there was a lot of working with people there. And I think a lot of being a successful leader and leading a team is having great interpersonal skills and people skills and being a great listener with the, with the people who are working with you. So I think, yes, I, I think I took that away from my former profession, but I also think that anybody, um, you know, from a young age, I think that, you know, being a great entrepreneur is one thing and being business minded is one thing, but having that gift of being great with people. And I'm not sitting here saying I'm a gift, but I'm just saying generally anybody who's a leader who works on and has that gift to, uh, be a positive role model, to listen to people, to appreciate people like those are just key because all these years later, for us, you know, 250 baristas now who work with Joe, uh, they are only here because their leadership, be it me, be it the, the level of uh, people who are, who are their sort of direct supervisors, are have learned to, um, you know, be great people, people. If we didn't have that, if we didn't strive through that for that, if that wasn't part of our culture, I'm 100% certain we wouldn't be where we are. Because why would anybody want to work their hardest for you if you don't um, care about them, connect with them, uh, know them on a personal level, et cetera, uh, and be a, you know, people need leadership. We've learned it's not just about, you know, being a buddy, but it's holding people accountable to certain, uh, to excellence and 
uh, accountability and rules and um you know this i i think i'm probably going off on a tangent not <laughs> answering your question but um i mean that's everything that's that's the success otherwise why you know why would 250 people care to give great service and make great coffee how do you guarantee that people will experience in your stores the things that you want them to experience as oh, you expand so again it's it's not easy um, and we're not perfect and I don't think it's impossible. I don't think it's possible for anybody to find perfection that way because the people who work at your stores are not robots and they come in with moods and, you know, personalities. And, um, I think it is, I think it goes back to sort of Danny's philosophy of applying constant gentle pressure, which is his term and always working to shape the people who are working with you to strive for excellence, to be better. Um, but I think also that is sort of a two way street. So it's always listening, having open dialogue, staying flexible with your staff. Um, you know, I, I know that I find as we grow and as I am unfortunately more and more removed from the day to day operations and the ability to be in the stores like I used to be, which is, not easy for me psychologically, to be honest. I miss it. And, um, you know, I, the fact that I'm at a point now where I can't guarantee that I'll get to every store every week is really difficult for me, both as someone who cares and a, a little bit of a control freak. And, um, but I think that, I think that as somebody grows and the person who potentially owns the shop is not on the floor amongst their coworkers and their staff, uh, it is, um, it's, it's two way constant communication. I think it's as simple as being nice and caring about the people who work for you again, to expect them to care about the place that they work and always going back to core values and mission. Um, for us, it's this idea of like the bigger we get, the smaller we have to run, the smaller we want, I shouldn't say have to, the smaller we want to run. Um, uh, and it's really, it's really that notion for me that, that keeps it working. Um, you know, we have had some very talented managers, GMs, but perhaps some of them have been missing what I'm sort of talking about. That doesn't work for us. I would just say goodbye and they can find a different place that suit, that is a better fit for us. Every single person at the store level who's running those stores needs to be caring and kind and respectful and a great communicator. Otherwise, the equation just doesn't work. Uh, and again, I wish that there was some magic fairy dust where I could say this is how one does it and it will always work, but that's never going to be the case at a certain point. Uh, but it is always you know, looking, I think, to, 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 live that, to live that way, to, to run your business that way. Uh, and know that a lot of it's still going to be organic because these are human beings interacting with other human beings. Well, there's so much more to hear from Jonathan in this episode, uh, so much to learn. And I was so thankful for getting the opportunity to sit down and talk with him. Go listen to this full episode. You're going to get so much out of it. And then to learn more about Joe Coffee Company, go visit their website, joecoffeecompany.com. Now, the last founder that we're going to hear from today is also from back in 2017, and that's episode 43 with Kathy Turiano of Joe Bean Coffee Roasters in Rochester, New York. This episode was inspiring. I love what they're about over at Joe Bean. And in this conversation, we focused a lot on change. We talked a lot about Joe Bean version one and how they changed the Joe Bean version two, uh, what all was involved in that process, and how ultimately uh, one of the major values is uh, the ability to partner with the future generation of professionals to decide the future of the company. Kathy talks about this in this clip today uh, and how she has developed her perspective on allowing the business to be steered by the staff and what that means uh, both for her, for the company, and the success of those who work in the company, which is one of the, her primary motivations as an owner. So let's listen in now to Kathy Turiano back from episode 43 of Keys to the Shop. How have you changed for the better through this whole process up until now? Uh, well, um, 
I work with family. <laughs> so, uh, which, um, it involves just a, a whole, uh, there's a whole bunch of challenges, I think, when it comes to working with family. And I think most times when people say that, it's a couple, you know, a husband and a wife that work together. Mm -hmm. I think it's a little unusual that it's um, myself and my son. And, you know, he has, he's very, has very strong opinions. And I think early on, like I said, you know, he, he brought so much vision to the table and so many, um, really radical ideas as to where we could bring the business or where we should bring the business. And it was, um, I, I had to really learn how to, how to listen and how to see what was there and, and how to, um, not just, uh, dismiss it, I guess, you know, sometimes when you're the older one in the group, <laughs> um, it's easy to say, well, you just don't understand, um, or you just don't see it or, you know, your idea is good, but, uh, you know, not for now. And although some of those things are valid, um, overall, I, I really realize this idea of partnering with the next generation is, um, requires, it, it is humbling, you know, that they would have something that you don't have. And, and yet, if you open yourself up to understanding what it is, um, it's a huge benefit. So kind of delegating and kind of handing the vision off, holding things with an open hand um, helps the business thrive. And certainly, I think you and I both have seen business owners um, and in businesses where there's like a death grip on control. And sometimes, and I feel like maybe most of the time that doesn't work out that well. Um, it, it maybe constricts people's excitement as employees and it, you know, having excitement behind the bar and in your work really translates over to the customer's experience too. Absolutely. I, I read somewhere a long time ago that, you know, every employee, uh, is actually a volunteer and, you know, they don't have to be there and they certainly don't have to also be an advocate for your business. And yet, if you do um, treat them in such a way that they are not, you know, just that employee, but instead they really are part of your team, um, then it gives them opportunity um, to decide uh, to be there and to decide how much they're going to immerse themselves into it. And I I, I do think that that, of course, trickles over to the customer experience. Um, we're so dependent on, you know, our team uh, being an advocate for Joe Bean. I mean, that is, it's a, it's a big benefit for us, but it's also the very reason that we exist. You know, we, we want not just the customers to have this experience, but our very own team. You know, we want to, we want to have a team that walks away and says, my time with Joe Bean, however long or short it is, um, was amazing. And it brought me to this new understanding or it, you know, brought me this benefit that I would never have had. And, you know, one of the things that is truly one of my absolute favorite things is seeing them successful. And, you know, it's, it's different than being successful yourself. And I think that was kind of the difference between Joe Bean one and Joe Bean two, if you will, you know, Joe Bean one was, you know, how do I get successful? And to me, this second round is all about how do I make them successful? And that is so much more satisfying. Well, certainly a value that a lot of us should apply to our own coffee shops and it would be of high value to focus on the success of the people that work for us. And uh, they're going to take on the vision. They're going to make sure that they're working well if they are being poured into in that way. Um, and, and Joe Bean has been a success story in that way. They've produced so many successful coffee people and helped so many people in their general professional journey. So if you want to listen to that whole episode, that's episode 43, Kathy Turiano, Joe Bean Coffee Roasters. And if you want to see what they're up to these days, you can go visit their website over at joebeanroasters.com. You know, as I take a look back over two and a half years and 30 Founder Fridays later, uh, one of the things that strikes me as common between everyone doing a great job uh, taking care of their staff and having a, a great employee culture is that 
it's never just accidental. It doesn't just happen by hiring the right people or, or giving people autonomy to do whatever they want. It's a conversation. It's a, a relationship that's um, organic and it takes effort and it takes humility. And when you're the owner, when you're the leader, reaching out first to serve your staff and seeing how they respond by owning the vision, by uh, taking up the mantle of the company more and more, that's just something that I've seen over the years that's common between all of these things. And to really narrow that down to something that I think is key, as you listen to these podcasts, as you listen to um, different people's perspectives, it's easy to want to just apply things as a solution to a problem that you're having in your store. If you've got a culture problem or uh, employee retention problem or things like that, um, it's easy to take information and try to just put it in place and see how it'll work. But you can't just do that and not also listen to your staff. In fact, I'd say the first thing to do, instead of taking what's being said here and just blindly applying it to your situation, you need to first start a conversation with your employees and tune in to the needs of the people who are making up your company right now. And then see where these things fit in for you currently. Um, and many people have tried to apply business principles to situations because it makes sense to them in their own head, but it doesn't actually make sense for the culture as it exists now in their own company. So as you get inspired by the Founder Fridays, and I'm so happy that we've been able to do so many uh, profiles of, of great founders over the past two and a half years, make sure that you don't pass over the opportunity to learn from the people who are making your business happen right now and that this is a conversation and not just a monologue of, and blindly applying principles of um, leadership and business into your cafe. So with that said, um, thank you so much for joining me. That's it for today's show. If you uh, want to reach out to me with questions or comments or feedback, you can do so by just emailing chris at keys to the shop.com. That's also where you can reach me if you want to inquire about keys to the shop consulting and training. And I uh, hope you have an amazing rest of your week. Thank you again for listening to Keys to the Shop. And as always, I hope that this episode has truly given you keys to the shop. <laughs>